How are you? Do you work up here? Can I touch the microphone? Oh, I don't, give me a dollar. If you give me a dollar, you can do it. Give me a dollar. Give me a dollar. Five dollars. Touch that one. Because you wanted to. Walking down the aisle with the black sweater on, ask her if you can. Because you can't, that's an instrument. You've got to be very careful. You break it, oh, it'll cost so much money to replace it. Hey, 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 didn't I say don't touch it? Emma. Emma. Hot wheels. Good morning, please take your hymnals and turn to page 240. I will sing of my Redeemer. Yeah, that's what this song is. Page 240. Let's all stand, shall we? I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me on the cruel cross. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood, he purchased me. On the cross, he sealed my pardon. Made the dead and made me free. This is our fellowship song. Let's fellowship. Page 240 on the second. I will tell the wondrous story of my lost estate to save. In his boundless love and mercy, he the ransom freely gave. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer with his blood. He purchased me on the cross. He sealed my pardon, made the dead, and made me free. On the last, I will sing of my Redeemer and his heavenly love to me. He from death to life hath brought me, Son of God. Sing of my Redeemer with his blood, he purchased me on the cross, he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. Can I pray down here? No. Not yet. Not yet. I'm leaving. Yep. You're going to after this. You can be seated. It's your anniversary this week. Yes, it is. Mrs. Ruley, you can come on up here, too. 
I know, I wouldn't want to do it either. I know. How many years? Ten good ones. Ten? Ten good ones. I know, how many? Eighty-eight. Eighty-eight? Forty-six. Forty-six. Wow. That's pretty good. Do you remember who was in your wedding? Okay, that's good. Amy. Yeah. All right, where'd you get married? Calvary. Where'd you go on your honeymoon? Did you stick around here? Well, did you we, go? yeah. No. The reason I'm asking, I'm testing their memory. This is not good so far. Right? We went that's to cool. Florida. You went to Florida, okay. Ask Amy, Ask Amy. is that true? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> when you think of them, what do you think of? One word that uh, yeah, don't say it. <laughs> One word that comes to my mind is faithful. I mean, honestly, how many I know it's their anniversary, but I'm thinking for 35, do I have that right? You've been here? 36. 36. I'm always a year behind. 36 years in one place. You know, that's what God has for them. But being here that long, that's faithful. I'm going to read just two verses. Proverbs 22 and verse 1 says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Verse 4 says, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. So they've been faithful to each other. They've been faithful to our church, so we have something for them. The car out there. <laughs> Somebody want to give me your keys? <laughs> we got to think of something. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Open it now. Whatever you want. I want to die after Amy, because if I die and she says anything at my funeral, <laughs> she lives with me. You think you know me? Right? Am I right? Right here. <laughs> Happy anniversary. As friendship, it began and grew until in love you said I do. Then day by day, you, you shared the fun of hopes and dreams, becoming one. Dear Pastor and Amy, you shared the journey side by side with God, your ever faithful guide, and seeing how sweet contentment grows as marriage blessings overflow. Enjoy a special time of celebrating his gift to you of each other. May the Lord bless you with many years together. Your church family, love your church family at Lakeside. And then there's a um, card. Barnaby's Pizza. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. You. Up here. you know, it's really fitting. I know you want to pray, but we really should do this. Happy anniversary. Ready? Happy anniversary. Remember when you were a kid and someone was married 25 years? Wow. We need to pray. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Amy is the luckiest woman in the world. <laughs> we said we do it all. We actually celebrate two anniversaries. We are very diligent about our wedding anniversary, but then our first date anniversary, April 12th, be 49 years. So she was three and I was four. <laughs> Time flies. And whether you're having fun or not, it still flies. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, you are a great God. You are a loving God. You're, you're the one that I call Father. You're my Heavenly Father. You're my Savior. Thank you for Amy. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you that she cared and her mom cared enough about my soul. This old heathen, they witnessed to me and prayed for me. I don't know what they thought. I don't know at that time if they ever thought, I wonder if he'll ever get saved. But God, I, I remember better than my wedding day. I remember when you saved me. How overwhelming that was. I, I still wonder why. How? But as I keep reading the Bible, it's just obvious that's who you are. You didn't save me because of me. You saved me because of you. And you saved me to make me what you wanted me to be. And I pray that I will cooperate. I want to be a better Christian. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better pastor. Lord, would you work in me today? We're all here and we're singing and we're praising God and we'll have preaching and we're thinking, okay, what's the message going to be? God, I just need you to speak to me. And you use me, speak through me. I'm yours. I'm your vessel. Just do a work that only you could do. I can't. I'm your vessel. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this church. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Page 243 in your hymnals, Wonderful Words of Life. Amen. 243. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. bulletin in choir you already know this but if you don't know this there is no choir it says choir but that has been canceled for this afternoon are they singing tonight oh I'm not coming I enjoy the choir I like I enjoy you I wish you'd do a special congregational special how many of you like to sing how many of you can't sing? How many of you are loud? How many of you love the Lord? It's like, man, he knows that. It's all that matters. Sing for him.
Sing for him. We're here tonight at 6 o'clock, but no choir. Just me. I wouldn't come. On the back side. On the back side. Lord willing, midweek, Awana at 6.45 on Wednesday, teens at 7, adults at 7. The Riffles next Sunday night, our missionaries to Japan, will be with, be with us in the evening service. Excited about that. Jail service on the 14th. For the men, see Roger if you're interested. Secret Sister tonight, they will draw names. See my wife if you have questions about that. There is a sign-up list for the afterglows. Yesterday was another important anniversary. One of the worst phone calls I ever got. The church is on fire. Three years ago, yesterday. Seemed like a month ago. Era called me frantic. Cops were calling me, people in the city, your church is on fire. It's like, I'm not just sitting here. I'm beating my shoes on, I'm on my way. They're calling me going, it's still on fire. I'm on my way. And then I'm, I'm racing here, and fire trucks are passing me. Six, seven of them just racing past me, and I'm thinking, man, my heart is just sinking. I'm just praying they're not coming to church, but they all did. So I kept up with them, and we all got here, and they surrounded the church, and the fire was right next door, just 20 feet past that door. And I don't know if you were here or remember that. And I got to tell you, God was so good to us through all that. Did we miss one service? I don't think we missed a service. And it was just so different. Then COVID hit. Do you ever feel like someone was stepping on your neck? You couldn't breathe? That's what that time period felt like. Because I'm, I'm, we were here for a couple weeks before the fire, right? Now I'm losing, but I think we were here and it was empty. Y'all weren't here. You were home in your PJs in bed watching church. And I was all dressed up doing church so you could have church. And then the fire, and then we moved next door to the youth building and rearranged and just went on. And they said, boy, you may have to do this for six months. And it was 16 months. But God has been good to us, very, very good to us. Through COVID, through the fire. So keep praying. We're still not done. I assume that the insurance company wanted to be done. But I guess we're going for four years. So they're still doing something. I don't know what they're doing. Things are not settled yet. All the bills are paid, I believe. Everything is accomplished. We're happy. I guess they're not happy. But we'll make it. Ushers, you come. Thank you for being here. Thank you for loving the Lord. No one, no one can love the Lord like you can. We, each of us, love the Lord individually when I pray watch when I pray the Lord says oh good but even when Ivan prays the Lord says oh good why because we each love him differently we love him in our way how we are and he loves that so just love the Lord no matter what, no matter what's going on, love him. If you think he's forgotten you, he hasn't, love him. If you don't like what he's doing, love him. And we know, and we know that all things work together for those that love God. Love him. Let's pray. Father, we need to love you. You love us, and you said we love you because you first loved us. Thank you for all that you've taken us through. Wow, heavy. Man, I've still got scars, 
And what a time. COVID, the fire. But Lord, you've been so good to us. You got us through it. And we just need you to be with us. We want to do what you want us to do. We don't want to try to figure it out. We just want to see what does God want and say, I'm going to do that. Thank you for this day. Thank you for our guests and our visitors. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
please take your hymnals once again. 244, When I See the Blood, page 244. Let's all stand on the first verse of Junior Church. You may be dismissed. seated. Abby is coming to sing now.
got a whole book full of sermons, and I don't like any of them. And when I just told the Lord that, he said, that's okay, as long as it's my word. I don't like them. I mean, it isn't I don't like his word. I don't like what I, my word, Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2. I study and study and always bring extra just in case the Lord wants to do something else. I want to be open to him. I don't want to be. Listen, I've determined some of the greatest advice I ever received was at college but not in college. It was actually in the barber shop. I had a great preacher tell me something I never heard in a classroom. He said, if you determine to do one thing in your life, your whole life, no matter if you're an evangelist, a Christian, or a pastor, he said, don't get mechanical. Don't go through the motions. I don't want to be mechanical. I don't want to get bored by the routine. I want the Lord to do something. I want my Christian life to be real. I want it to be exciting. I want it to be alive. I don't want it to be a habit. I don't want to read my Bible because I ought to. I, I want to read my Bible because I need to. I want to. I enjoy it. I want to pray. Yes, I need it. Yes, I ought to. Kind of like being married. It's more fun when you want to be. You know, we make a big deal about it. I told Amy the other day, maybe it was yesterday, I said, you know what? Were we on the phone? I said, you know what? I like you. She's heard me say I love you every day of her life. But I don't tell her enough I like her because I do like her. I like her. I want to be with her. So you made a vow to love her. See, that's what I mean. I never made a vow to like her. But I fell in love with her because I liked her. And now I like her because I love her. And I love her because I like her. Hey, what's that mean? I don't know. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I'm not a scholar. I don't want to be a scholar. I'm more of a prophet. Just God said, tell them this, and I, I'm, I can do that. I'm, I'm a reminder. A lot of people walk away and go, well, well, I didn't get anything out of that. Well, that point is to remind you to do what you already know. Because you and I have a lot of things. We don't need to know something else. We need to do what we already know. So there. If you're always trying to learn something new, you'll be more tempted not to do what you already know. Right? Hello? Hello? You, you know it's true. We think we're a better Christian if we learn something new. When we're struggling with stuff that we ought to be doing that we already know. And we think that we're spiritual if we're uh, learning something that we never knew. I I'm pretty sure the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. You'll never know all you ought to know. So just have fun doing what you know. And God will teach you when you need to learn something. Philippians chapter 2. Paul is in jail. Paul doesn't know everything. Paul is learning. Paul is teaching us what he's learned. Notice what he says. Two verses. Great chapter. Two verses. Verse 12 and 13. 
I'll let you cheat and look at them and read them. Because even when I read slow, I can see your lips moving. Your lips are moving faster than I'm reading. So just get it out of your system. Because we read slow here. You know, some of these guys that, hey, turn you out, Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. They start reading them all, and then they get into the brain. But, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm loud and deliberate. And it's very easy for me to go at that speed. But that won't help you. The scriptures are important. Hey, you don't have to be here two weeks and you... That's how we feel. The scriptures are important. Verse 12. Did you read it already? So now you know more than me. He writes, wherefore? Wherefore, my beloved? We always grab the meat of the verse and we miss the point of the verse. I don't know what that verse says. And we have. Hey, we've become very ritualistic. We don't live our Christian life on purpose. We just live it by routine. We go to church, we sing, offerings come. Now he's going to do this, now he's going to do that. So he's going to preach now. When he's all done, uh, we'll have an invitation and then we'll leave and your life won't be any different. I failed, you failed, if that's the case. So when he's writing here, He's saying, wherefore? Of course he addresses them, my beloved. But the wherefore is just more than what he said. It's like he's saying, I, I need you to understand what you need to understand. Not just hear it, but understand it, get it. So notice what he says. As ye have, this is quite a statement. As ye have always obeyed. He means most of the time. None of us always obey. Ladies, your husband always obeys. Isn't it funny you don't have to say no? You just chuckle and we all know you mean no. Men, your wives don't always obey. Your kids do, but your wives don't. He said, wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed. And now he kicks it up a step Hi. He goes, not as in my presence only. You remember my nun story, right? Third grade. Sitting in a desk. I'm on the aisle. She turns around to write on the blackboard. I jump on the floor. I make like I'm driving a race car. My buddies are laughing. She was kind of a full-figured woman. And it took her a while to get around, kind of like one of those revolving restaurants. I, I'm just saying it so you'll get it. So when she turned around, it took her a while, I could be back up in my seat. She swivels around, I'm in my seat, everybody's quiet. She says, I saw that. I'm thinking, you're a liar, you're a nun, but you're a liar. 
She said, see me after class. Class was over. I went up. Her name was Sister Frances Gertrude. And she looked like that too. I said, sister, what did you see? She said, I saw you get on the floor. I don't know what you were doing, but I know you left your desk and you got on the floor and then you got back in your desk. I went. Yeah. I go, but tell me something. How did you know that? Remember cat eyes, cat eye glasses? Now they're back. But way back in the 1920s when I was in school, they, she took off her cat eye glasses and in the corner of her cat eye she had little mirrors. If I knew she was watching, I would have never pulled that. I wouldn't have waved at her and said, I'm going to get on the floor now and pretend I'm driving a race car. Watch this, Sister Frances Gertrude. I waited till I thought she couldn't see me. And now every time in that class she would turn around and write on the board, I would go, Say, but she can see you. That's right. I didn't do that. That'd be dumb. If she can't see me, I'm going to try to get away with it. Paul says in verse 12, not as in my presence. You've always obeyed. Not as in my presence only. That is quite a statement, quite a compliment. He was aware that when he was not there, in their presence, as he puts it, he says, verse 12, but now much more in my absence. Anybody can obey when God's watching. See, but God is always watching. That's right, but we don't think he is. I mean, we know that in theory. Proverbs 15 and verse 3 says, For the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. That's what it says. So either we believe that or we don't. Either we believe, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Either we believe that as much as we believe that God sees us. He sees everything. He doesn't just see when you're good and go, oh, good. He sees when you're bad and says, oh, no. So Paul addresses his church at Philippi, and he's writing to them from jail, and he says, you've always obeyed, and you haven't just obeyed when I'm there, but now when I'm not there. He said, keep it up, work out. Look at verse 12. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Keep it up. Don't stop. That's what matters. You know Paul, if you've read Paul, if you've read the way he, he Paul, Galatians chapter 2, when Peter, I mean, nobody tangled with Peter, but Paul did. Paul said, I waited for Peter. When Peter came, I got, him, I got in his face because he was to be blamed. So Paul wasn't the one that would go, oh, God bless you. You're not obeying all the time. Well, God bless you. At least you're trying. Paul was the kind to go, what's the problem? Why aren't you obeying? Why are you doing the wrong thing? So Paul is telling them, I'm not there. I'm not there to look over your shoulder. I'm not there to keep on you. I'm absent from you, verse 12. But you need to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The fear and trembling does not have to do with the presence of Paul. The fear and trembling has to do with the presence of the Lord. I, I know God sees me. Do you? Can I ask you a question? This is very personal. If you got on a scale, I don't care what it said when you got on it. But did you do anything this week you shouldn't have done? That if God was in the room, you wouldn't have done it? Don't move your head. Don't raise your hand. I just want you to think about it. Did you do anything this week that if God was in the room, you wouldn't have done it? 
Don't ask me. I'm not answering. Paul is saying you know how to obey. He didn't say work on your obedience. He said work out your salvation. Work out who you are. Work out who you belong to. Salvation is of the Lord. It's not from you. It's not from your works. It's from Him. He's watching. He wants you to do it for Him. That's what verse 12 is saying. And then he says in verse 13, man, this is so cool. Thank God for these. These verses have been, they're in the top three of my Christian life. These two verses have helped me more in my Christian life than all the, the, these are in the top three. Notice verse 13. For it is God. Look up. Take a breath. You, we don't finish faster because you finish yet. Huh? You know how when you go like this to me, so I'll hurry up? You, you saw that doesn't work. So you reading it, you know, go, not stopping and, and it, because we're going to get out of here late. Save your effort. Verse 13, for it is God. He just told them in verse 12 to work out your own salvation. Be obedient. He said, you've always obeyed, not just when I'm there, but I'm not there. Now much more, notice verse 12, now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13, for it is God which worketh in you. I can be obedient because God's working in me. I'm not obedient because I'm bullheaded and I am. I'm not obedient because I'm stubborn and I am. I'm not obedient because I'm Italian, and I am. I'm not obedient because I'm Polish, and I am. Someone asked me the other day, you're Polish? So is that a bad thing, Fred? So is that a bad thing? Well, 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 well no. My name is not Ruliski. Got my dad's name. My mother was a full blood. I know how to be stubborn. Hey, I know how to hold a grudge forever. But he tells me in verse 13, God works in us both to will, both to will and to do. Both to will, see verse 13? Both, 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 not one, not heavy on one, light on the other, both, both, both to will and and to do, both to will and to, both to will and to do, both. Do you see to do there in verse 13? See it? To do, see, to will. Do you see it? We struggle with the to do because we don't let God work in us to will. God should not have to fight with us. I said us. I didn't say you. Some of you look at me like, us. Our will. Even Jesus said, Father, not my will. He's giving us an example. Notice he closes that verse. He says both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Pray with me. Father, may every man in this room feel like a tank ran over him. May every woman in this room feel like they got hit by a truck. Lord, so that we will respond to your word. So that we will know you're trying to talk to us. Not just, oh, I'm in church, oh, he'll be done soon, oh, I'm used to his voice, I'm used to his inflection, I'm used to his pace, I'm used to his volume. God, we're not used to your spirit. So may the spirit of God speak to us today. 
so that we feel like, wow, that was like getting hit by a truck or run over by a tank. God, speak to us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When Paul in Acts chapter 16 was in Philippi to start this church, he was preaching the gospel. He led a, a young lady to the Lord. All of a sudden, another gal comes up and is causing problems. He finally, Acts 16 tells us, he has an exorcism. And he calls out the demon of this young gal. Everybody gets upset with Paul. They, they have taken, Paul and Silas have taken away their means of gain. So they throw them in jail. They beat them up first. I mean, they beat them up. Whip them, pound them, shackle them to a wall. And good old Paul at midnight says to Silas, you know what? I don't know how you'd be feeling, but I would go, this stinks. This is not fair. Man, we're here starting a church. People are getting saved. We're casting demons out. Now we're beat up. We're in jail. What in the world? But Paul looks at Silas and he goes, you know what? I'm in a singing mood. And Silas looked at Paul and he said, you're what? Paul said, I, I just feel like we ought to pray and sing. Isn't that the kind of Christian you want around you all the time? Get you through the hard times? They're in jail. They think God is gone, but they decide at midnight to pray and sing praises to God. You know what God does? God shows up. Acts 16, read it. God shakes the whole earth. He could have opened the doors without an earthquake, but it's much more cool to do it the way God did it. Right? I mean, just unlock a door. Hey, look, the door's unlocked. Not God. God rumbles the whole ground. And then the jailer and other prisoners are going, wow. Those guys were just praying. Look what happened. Notice what he says here in Philippians 2 and verse 12. I love the three verses now much more. Paul knew what God could do. Paul knew what God was capable of when you're obedient. Paul knew that God knew they shouldn't be there for what they did. And honestly, you and I know they didn't like it. But they knew God wanted them there. Paul is saying in verse 12, it's hard to obey. You don't just go, oh, I get to obey. No, it's hard, man. It's tough. People make fun of you. People persecute you. He's saying, I know it's hard to do the right thing. But you're doing the right thing. And nobody's around and nobody's watching. But now much more you need to, verse 12, work out. Keep working on it. I'm finding that out. I'm finding out after being a Christian for 48 years, you got to keep working on it. You don't glide. You don't put it on autopilot. You don't just open the Bible and go, oh, I've read that before. I'm reading the Bible this morning going, God, I'm reading Proverbs chapter 4, okay? If you think I'm bragging, let me help you. Yes, I'm bragging. I've read Proverbs chapter 4. Every month for 44 years. Say so you're bragging. Yes, I am. But I'm bragging about God's word. 
I didn't write it. He did. I'm just reading it. I mean, you don't go around, Brad, I read the paper today. I read the cereal box today. Wouldn't you go big deal? I'm not bragging about what, what I did. I'm bragging about what I read. And I'm telling the Lord before I read it, now, Lord, I know and you know I've been reading this verse. Every verse I'm about this chapter, I have read this chapter, Lord, as faithfully as I can every month for 44 years. Please make it special to me. Please make the third. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm thinking of my anniversary. I'm throwing you off, aren't I? It's my anniversary tomorrow. God can do more now, much more. God can do more than I need now. God can help me now. Now much more. Paul's not just saying, oh, that sounds cool. Paul is saying, I know he can help me. He helped me, and he can help you. And so he says, now much more, because God knows what he can do. That's all that matters. You have to be careful how you live the Christian life. Fear and trembling, that's being careful. Verse 13 says that we ought to work with God. God has a plan, he has a way, he has a purpose. He can get you where you and I need to get to. You know what you'll take to heaven? You'll only take to heaven what God does in you. Hey, you save money. You do, my tax guy says, hey, you know, you have no social security. I don't know how you're going to live. That's because he thinks numbers. And I always respond, God knows how I'm going to live. He can take care of me. Well, you need to put money in your IRA. I do. I want to spend it, but, I, I, but you know what? I don't, when I get to heaven, I want to go, God, I had an IRA down there. And that one, and I'd like, is there a way to get that? Like, you give me a half bag gold or, like, you know, gold tooth, something that I put all that money. Hey, you know, the only thing that will matter when we get to heaven is what God does in us. Two simple points, number one. Number one. It's your, first point, it's your obedience. It's not his obedience, it's your obedience. It's for him, because of him, to him. Notice verse 12. Work out, he says. So he goes from obedience, whether he's watching or not, to working out your own salvation. You know what that means? You're all alone. No one can help you but you. You don't get help but you. It's your own. It's you. You look at someone else and go, well, how? they're obedient. They read, boy, it seems like God answers their prayers. You can do that. You, you can get as blessed as anybody else. God is not a respecter of persons. God does not say, man, I really like Italians. I mean, he may say that. You and I can work out our own salvation. That's up to me. If anybody's watching, I want to live for him. He's in me. If he wasn't in me, I'd have no desire for him. It's
It's a thing we call hunger. Do you ever get hungry for something? Like, man, I could really go for whatever you're hungry for. I'm just hungry now. I had a piece of toast. I'm hungry. I mean, I wish I'd hurry. I'm hungry. And I know you're, amen, amen. I'm hungry. Say, what are you going to have? I want a big pretzel. That's what I'm hungry for. I'm not hungry for okra. I mean, I like fried okra. I like Brussels sprouts dipped in chocolate. No, I like them. See, if you have too much flesh in your life, then your hunger for spiritual things is diminished. He doesn't say work out your life. He says work out your own salvation. We ought to look saved, walk saved, act saved, talk saved, think saved, because we are. We obey because of who we are. I don't obey God because I have to. I do that because of who I am. I'm my own. And he makes it very clear in verse 13 that it is God, for it is God which worketh in you. I have to be hungry for him. So I work out my salvation. I'm obedient if I'm hungry for him. How do I get a hunger for God? I Keep looking at him. I have a whole file on my phone. There's over 150 pictures in this picture file of food. I do not. I do not open that file and skim through those pictures and go, ooh, mmm, oh, Ah, uh, mm. I already know what it looks like. But you know something happens when you look at a picture? You want to taste it. The picture doesn't satisfy. The picture is just, hey, you ought to get one of these. I have pictures of cookies. I know what they taste like. Pie. Ice cream. I don't even like ice cream. But it looks good to look at. Don't talk about food, Larry. We're all hungry. We're all hungry. Holy thoughts are from God, and we need to give God our mind and our hunger because we can't do without him and we need to be sensitive to him say yes to him and we need to desire to be different than we are right now that's why he says in verse 12 but now much more so your obedience depends on what God can do not on what you can do you just obey him do what he wants and you hunger for him your own your own listen, your own obedience number two his good pleasure. Now, here's where this gets tricky and ugly. Does God want me, let me test your Bible now. Does God want me to not, is it a commandment that I shall not kill? Jesus said, I want to one-up that. If you're angry with your brother, you've murdered him. Is that in the Bible? Yes. He said, if you commit adultery with a woman, that's adultery. He said, if you look after a woman and want her, that's adultery. Does that please God to do what he wants? 
Hello, you here? Does it please God to do what he wants? Always. So now he's saying, for it is God, verse 13, it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do. See, you got to stay away from the tree. If you're by the tree, it's easier to eat. Genesis chapter 3. So Adam and Eve go, nah, we don't, we don't have to eat it. We'll just hang out by it. Well, they ate. My Bible says James chapter 1, but every man is tempted. When he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You see, God wants to give you and I the desire and the power. Please listen. God wants to give you and I the desire and the power to do his will. He can give you the power, but then you become mechanical. He wants to give us the desire. Because notice that verse says, both to will and to do of his good, doesn't say commandment, doesn't say law, it says pleasure. In other words, is what I'm doing pleasing to God? The desire and power Verse 13 is telling these people in Philippi th th that why verse 12 is true. We, we call that in college context. You can't just say, I like that verse. No, verse 13 is telling us why verse 12 is true. This is why you've always obeyed. When I'm there, when I'm not there, keep on it and you do, you work out your salvation because it is God which worketh in you both to will, desire, and to do the power of his good pleasure. You go to church. You find a church, you can dance, you can sing, you can have church. But I want you to say, I desire and I need the power to please God. You'll be much happier. You'll be much happier. The hard part is the doing. We have, we have the desire. It's just sometimes it's the wrong desire. You don't need holy feelings. If all you needed was feelings to be holy, then you and I should be angels. I want to be right. I want to be right. The same God that gives you the right desire is the same God that can give you the, listen, it's the same God that can give you the power to stop the unholy desires. Remember that question, what did you do this week? Did you do anything this week that didn't please God? That same power of verse 13 is available to get you away from the wrong desires. Better men, better men, way better men than I have failed. Why? They didn't trust God for the power not to do what, what was not pleasing to him. Can't live just by desire. Can't just get stirred up. Got to do something about it. That's why we have invitations. So, you know, churches aren't having those anymore. What, I, do you know where you're at? Quit comparing me to other churches. I mean, you're here. If, if, if they're all alike and that's what they're starting to become, then what's the point? Right? Remember when everybody started wearing their hat crooked? 
You know why they did that? Well, it'd be different. Now they're all wearing a head crooked. And they wear their pants low. If one guy does it, it's cool. When y'all do it, it's dumb. I tried it. It it doesn't, it's hard. I'm thinking, why are they doing I'm not getting this. I have a desire for a belt. And the waist. And my waist isn't down there. See, they have a desire. They have a desire to be like everybody else. But Paul is saying it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And we will fail if we don't trust God for his power. And we shouldn't limit God by refusing to hunger for his power so that we satisfy him. It's a fantasy world if you want to please God, but you don't ask him to give, to give you his power to be able to do it. I want to show you a verse, and then we're done. Got a minute? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Not far. It's not far. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm sorry, chapter 1. I can't read my own typing. That helps. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. God, listen to what I'm about to say. You're finding that verse? Try not to read it. Can we read it? I want to read it with you. God can make your desire for him stronger than any other desire. How many of you need that? God can make your desire for him stronger than any other desire. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. Wherefore, there's that word again. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Can I ask you a question? Are your desires holy? God will only help you to please him if you hunger after him. That salvation that you're supposed to work on comes because he's in you and gives you the desire to do what he wants and the power to do it. Look, you can look good on the inside and be rotten to the core on you can look good on the outside and be rotten to the core on the inside. Hey, you're not up here. Don't make fun of me. You try this. Hey, because I've already started on tonight's message. Hey, you can look good on the outside but be rotten to the core on the inside. And the only thing that will change that is a desire for God and the power of God. Or you and I could be just like anybody else that goes way off into sin. Did you hear me? Hey, did you hear me? The desire that you need and I need to do what God wants can come from God. Your head bowed, your eyes closed. Lord Jesus, I, I am so frustrated with me I, I want to be a good Christian I'm just asking you to work in me so I desire or as you put it 
to will. To will. I want what you want. That shouldn't be a big struggle. I mean, you said for it is God which worketh in you. You're in me. That to will ought to be easy. But man, it seems hard. And I'm sure somebody else is thinking the same thing. I want my desire to be for you. Work in me, Lord. Work in me to will and to do what pleases you. Yes, I need that. It's my salvation, yes. But it will affect others. I want my life to affect others for the good. Give me, give me the desire. Give me the will. And give me the power to do what pleases you. I hope many, I hope every person in this room would pray that prayer. God, give me the desire and the will and the power to do what pleases you. All the time, always. As Paul said it, in my presence you obeyed, but you did it as much and more in my absence. Because that's what matters. And only God can do that. Only a God giving us the right desires and the power can help us as we obey God wherever, whenever. Oh, God, oh, please, God. For men and women and young people in this room right now, for those watching, may their prayer be my salvation needs work. And the best way to work it out to have the right desire and the power to do what pleases God. So God, give me that. Give me that. Give me that, God. Please give me that. Lord, would you cause many decisions because of your word, many decisions to be made today because of the Holy Spirit. Not because of Pastor Rutley, but because of the Holy Spirit. Your head bowed, your eyes closed. This is about you. This isn't about me. This is about each of us. Preacher, I want to desire what pleases God, and I want the power to do what pleases God all the time. Every second of every day. No matter who's around or who's not. No matter what I'm going through. I need the desire. As God puts it. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Preacher, your head bowed, your eyes closed. Preacher, would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? Here's my hand. Here's my hand. That's, that's my prayer. I want that to happen today. Here's my hand. I'll wait. I'll wait. I'll wait. Lift it high. Preacher, that's me. God's speaking to me. God's speaking to me. This isn't about me speaking to you. This is about God. God, God ran you over today and you're going to be obedient to God and you're going to say, God, I, I won't leave this place until you get what you want. That's the kind of Christian I want to be. I don't want to be the kind of Christian I want to be. I want to be the kind of Christian you want me to be. That's who I'm talking to. You say, I don't even know if I'm a Christian. Then let us take a Bible and show you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven when you die. If you don't know that, let us show you. And if you're a Christian, 
and you want the right desire and the power, then you just lose all your pride. And in a moment when the piano plays and you're standing, you just get out of your seat. Get to this altar, whether you stand or kneel, and you tell God, God, you help me. Help me, Lord, please. The Christian life is about pleasing you, not about pleasing anyone else. It's about pleasing you. The only way that I can do that is with the right desire and the right power. Cause that to happen in me, God. Ask him that, would you? Ask him that. Say, God, cause that to happen in me. And if you mean it, he'll do it. If you're just looking for an easy way out, a cheap way out, or, or an emergency escape, You mean it. You tell God, God, this is about you. This is not about me. This isn't about what I like. This is about what you want. This is about the power you have to give me so I can do what you want because you gave me the desire to do what you want. Lord, would you please make it hard for us today not to respond. Yeah, it's hard. Hard to leave our seat. We think, man, everybody's looking at me. Everybody thinks I'm just awful. God, we all know that we're all awful. Why do we act like we're better? We hear the message and we act, I'm better. I'm better. He's not talking to me. Well, all we're saying is God can't talk to me. I don't let God talk to me. I don't let God get through to me. I just fight God and resist God and quench the spirit and grieve the spirit look at me don't be like me because i fight god and i resist god we're supposed to resist the devil we're supposed to draw nigh to god we're supposed to submit ourselves to god i pray that will happen today in this invitation because i ask it in jesus name piano's playing you're standing you're standing as soon as you get up as soon as you get up tell your feet here we go let's go You're standing, she's playing, tell your feet. Shuffle, let's go, shuffle, move, move, let's go, let's go. The devil's going to say, oh, you're okay, don't worry about it, stay there. Come on, come on, come on. God's beating your heart, God's challenging your, you, you had that urge, you had that unction in you to desire what God wants you to desire and to do what God wants you to do. Let that, let that go, man. Let that go. Let that bring you to this altar. Let that bring you to the decision you ought to make. Come on, come on. As she plays, God speak to your heart. You come, you come. She'll play it through again. She'll play it through again. If you're fighting it, would you just say, okay, I'll do it. Or Neil, man, if that works for you, fine. But if you're not going to walk down an aisle and make a decision, you're not going to make a change in your life. And if you're not making a change in your life, you're telling me you're everything you ought to be. And I'm having a hard time believing that. Don't you worry about anybody else. Don't you think about anybody else. This is about you. This is about your salvation and his good pleasure. This is about your own salvation and his good pleasure. Think of that. This is about your own salvation and his good pleasure. Is he pleased with the way you're working out your own salvation? He ought to be. He ought to be. Lord Jesus, fill us. We need to be filled with the Spirit. We need to walk in the Spirit. May this message ring in our heart all day. 
even to the point of making us restless until we figure out what you want. Until we give in to you. Thank you, Spirit of God. Thank you. Bless us, Lord. Bring us back tonight. Because, of course, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.